Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on Hodgkin Lymphoma webinar. I'm Diana, and I'll be your moderator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from two expert speakers, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you may ask them at any time by typing them into the Q&A box on the webinar screen. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you are listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. And now, I am pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Jesse, welcome to the program. Thank you, and thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's update on Hodgkin Lymphoma webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsor of this webinar, Bristol Myers Squibb. We have callers from 38 states across the U.S., as well as patients and caregivers from nine countries around the world. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we are thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. We have a wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm honored to introduce you first to Dr. Ryan Lynch. Dr. Lynch is an assistant professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He is also a practicing physician at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and a member of the Clinical Research Division of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Dr. Lynch, I will now turn the talk over to you. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, and thank you, everybody who's listening. I see the number of listeners going up as we're a couple minutes into the program. I also uh, want to thank everybody for showing up, especially given the circumstances of uh, coronavirus, and I certainly hope all the listeners there are staying safe uh, and staying healthy. Um, I hope to provide today uh, a broad update on Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, and But in order to do that, I think it's pretty important to give some good background uh, and also to uh, put our current therapies in historical context. Uh, so just as background, uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma represents about 10% of all lymphomas, and so that uh, accounts for 8,500 new cases annually in the United States. Uh, the positive side of Hodgkin lymphoma is that despite uh, how advanced it can be at presentation, it's highly curable with frontline therapy, uh, and that's generally been uh, chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy. Uh, with standard approaches, uh, uh, over 90% of early stage patients uh, and around 75 to 80% of advanced stage patients may be cured with that first treatment regimen. There are some varying presentations of Hodgkin lymphoma, and I always like to talk about how uh, unusual this can be and try to validate patients' um, feelings that uh, they weren't listened to for months or sometimes even years before the diagnosis. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that the most common way that this presents is with painless lymphadenopathy or painless and large lymph nodes. Uh, and the chest or the mediastinum is involved in about 70 to 90 percent of cases. Uh, this is primarily because the cell of origin for this type of cancer is thought to be in the thymus, which is a lymphoid organ uh, that's in the chest. Uh, B symptoms are confusing uh, because uh, a lot of patients uh, will complain of night sweats, but the night sweats related to Hodgkin lymphoma are quite unmistakable. Uh, so this isn't feeling damp in the morning. Uh, this is having absolutely, uh, feeling absolutely drenched as if you need to change your shirt multiple times at night. Uh, the sheets would be wet in the morning uh, and they're quite uncomfortable. Um, and other types of B symptoms can be fevers, chills, and sometimes unexplained weight loss. Uh, some other more vague complaints that are common as well is uh, itching or pruritus without a rash. Um, and Many patients will go to dermatologists before uh, eventually getting diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, and the reason they go to dermatologists is many times the scratching itself leads to a rash. Um, and then the most unusual one is alcohol-induced pain. And so this is pain where the lymph nodes are. And if you ever have talked to somebody who's had this, and I've had 
the opportunity to talk to several people who have this, it's a, quite a striking story and very unmistakable. So this would be somebody who within minutes of having a drink, whether it's a beer or liquor or wine, uh, knows very intense pain uh, to the point where they need to stop drinking. And the patients will actually make the connection between alcohol and pain. And uh, for those who have it, they will usually complain about it. Um, and then there's other more vague symptoms that aren't specific for uh, lymphoma. So it could be cough, lightheadedness. And a lot of this is just due to compression of the, the windpipe and uh, some of the blood vessels related to sometimes a very large mass. And oftentimes they'll be asked, well, how can the mass get so big? Well, there's a lot of room in the chest and there are no pain receptors in the chest. So uh, Hodgkin lymphoma can get quite bulky before eventually it gets large enough and some symptom happens. So this could be a lymph node in the neck. This could be a cough that pushes on, a cough uh, because it pushes on the windpipe. Um, and there's a variety of different ways that that can happen. Another thing that uh, is not often known about Hodgkin lymphoma is that the cancer cell is actually quite rare inside even a large mass. And so this type of cell is called the Reed Sternberg cell, and it's this owl-eyed cell that you can see on the left side. Uh, so it's got two circles and it's the largest cell that's there. Uh, but surrounding that big, large cell uh, are actually normal cells. Those are normal immune cells and the very different types of immune cells. And if you take a look at the big, uh, the picture on the right, so that's a more zoomed out view of a tumor, uh, the pink areas through there aren't cells at all. That's actually uh, uh, fibrotic or scar tissue throughout the tumor. So most of what you see inside this tumor is not actually cancer. And so this can lead to a lot of challenges in getting to a diagnosis. Uh, so patients who have what we call a fine needle aspiration, which is where a uh, usually inside a clinic room, someone will come in with a very tiny needle and essentially try to suck the cells out into a syringe. Uh, well, that is not going to diagnose Hodgkin lymphoma. Those cells are very large, look at damage by that needle. So most of what you get out are normal looking cells. It may provide false reassurance. Hopefully somebody will say, well, let's investigate that further. Uh, core biopsies, which is a larger needle, uh, so that can actually remove part of the lymph node intact instead of sucking it out. Uh, those also may not be sufficient, but in some cases may be enough to diagnose it. Uh, but taking out a piece of the lymph node or the entire lymph node offers the highest chance of diagnosis. And it's also important to exclude other types of lymphoma. So looking at it under the microscope, uh, many pathologists uh, at first glance can tell it's lymphoma. Uh, but many additional tests need to be done to make sure it's not one of these other types of lymphoma here, many of which are treated very differently. And then the last thing I like to say about getting to the diagnosis is it's, I would say about six months or so is about the average in terms of time from first symptom to diagnosis. And the longest I've seen has been, was close to two years. And so um, this isn't a primary care doctor's fault. This isn't the specialist's fault. Uh, Hodgkin lymphoma is pretty rare. I see it a lot, but I'm a lymphoma specialist and they all come to me after diagnosis. Uh, a primary care physician may only diagnose one Hodgkin lymphoma patient of their own in their lifetime, if at all. So uh, this is not something that uh, first pops to mind uh, and oftentimes takes excluding the more common causes for these complaints before getting the diagnosis. After diagnosis, it's, uh, there are several things that are very important. Uh, the stage is important that helps determine what the treatment is and how long the treatment needs to last. Uh, PET scans uh, are mandatory uh, and are standard uh, here in uh, North America or in, as well as Western Europe. Certain countries that don't have access to PET may use CT scans, but certainly here in the U.S. we're using PET. Um, bone marrow biopsies are no longer required uh, for Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, this is something that changed in the guidelines, I think sometime in the past three to five years. Um, it very rarely changes uh, what the oncologist does, and it's actually a reflection of how sensitive the PET scans are. So if there's Hodgkin lymphoma in the bone marrow, you're probably going to see it, uh, or almost assuredly, in fact, going to see it on the PET scan. Uh, and then there's some baseline blood tests as well as a physical exam to feel if there's any lymph nodes. And then this is the staging system for Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, I, I, I get a lot of uh, questions about this in the clinic room. Uh, there is a lot of fixation on stage 
but the stage, I think, it doesn't affect the curability, meaning even stage four patients can be cured. Uh, there are some slight differences in the cure rates uh, between the stage one and stage four. So certainly being stage one uh, is better than being stage four, uh, but there aren't stage four. Uh, I think that the fact that stage four is usually associated with incurable and fatal um, works against us as a provider. And I think um, I caution patients about sharing stages uh, with friends and family unless those friends and family know the context of what that stage means. Otherwise, telling someone I have stage four Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, if they don't know that that can be cured, might communicate the wrong thing. Um, typically, after the number, uh, there's a letter. So uh, if you have B symptoms, there's a B. If there's no B symptoms, it's an A. Uh, and then there's a couple of risk stratification systems that um, were probably used more historically. We, we don't use them as much now, uh, but uh, this is early stage, um, uh, favorable and unfavorable, and advanced stage uh, has a, a prognostic score um, uh, called the IPS score. I also get asked a lot, what causes Hodgkin lymphoma? Uh, so uh, it is an immune cell origin from the thymus. Uh, it's most related to B cells, but it doesn't have some of the mature B cell characteristics. Um, so it's probably some defective immune response that leads to Hodgkin lymphoma. But what causes that defective immune response is not clear. Um, many of the studies that have tried to look at this are several decades old. Um, there's some concern that perhaps there are environmental factors, uh, and some of this has to do with uh, some clusters in certain communities or even familial clusters. Uh, but uh, there's also been research linking it to mono. So this is um, a virus that I would say 90% of people get at some point in their life and eventually it resolves. Uh, but in some people, this mono may lead to Hodgkin lymphoma. But again, this is not to say that everybody who gets it gets Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, millions of people per year are infected with this. And most people have had been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus once during their lifetime but we don't see 100% of people getting Hodgkin lymphoma. So there's clearly some other factors in play as well. Uh, it's not contagious. So one cannot have a virus passed on to them that causes Hodgkin lymphoma uh, directly. So it's certainly okay to take care of caregivers. And it's not something that gets passed to children. So if a, you know, if a father has it, it's not that their children are doomed to get it. This isn't something that's written or etched into one's DNA. That being said, patients who have similar genetics and similar environment may have an increased risk due to that. But again, this is not 100% risk of getting it. So th these are things that are a little bit confusing uh, uh, to try to tease out, but I do feel very comfortable saying this is something that's not contagious, can't pass it to children. So in terms of incidence by age, so this is a graph, and I'll try to walk through this here. So this is uh, uh, the, the higher the line is, the more likely somebody is to be diagnosed with it. At the bottom is age. And so there's a peak of Hodgkin lymphoma in the late teens through early 30s. And then there's a second peak uh, when patients get uh, over age 60. Um, and so you tend to think of Hodgkin lymphoma as a cancer of young adults, um, that is probably because getting cancer as a young adult is extremely rare. And if someone gets cancer as a young adult, it's usually one of only a few types of cancer. So Hodgkin lymphoma stands out as a young person cancer. Um, there are a number of older patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, but every other type of cancer, virtually every other type of cancer, also becomes more common at that age group. So it gets I guess, relatively lost among some of these other cancers. And so the most important thing, I, when I meet a patient uh, with Hodgkin lymphoma, regardless of the point uh, of their treatment, whether it's uh, before they've ever received treatment, after they've had one, two, three, four, five uh, lines of therapy, is to, to always discuss what the goal of a treatment is. Uh, and I think that's extremely important. I think occasionally I will see patients who have received treatment 
uh, not understanding that in certain cases the, that it wouldn't cure people or it would cure you. So for frontline therapy, the goal of treatment is cure in Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, the thing that varies, however, is the chance for success, and that varies based on the stage, whether there's other medical conditions that would prevent receiving uh, the appropriate therapy, as well as age. And so uh, to go way to the past um, to try to gain a sense of um, a perspective for where we are now, I think it's important uh, to put some historical context. And so uh, Hodgkin lymphoma was originally called Hodgkin's disease uh, uh, in the early 1800s. And one of the reasons for this, it goes back to the, uh, the slide I showed you before, where there aren't a lot of cancer cells in these large masses. These actually, these cells look normal. Uh, so it wasn't clear at all that this was cancer uh, initially. And so it was described as Hodgkin's disease. And then anything that had a lot of uh, lymphoid cells in there that didn't look like Hodgkin's disease was called non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We know now there are dozens and dozens of subtypes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, so that's just a general term. But the Hodgkin's disease uh, was a uniformly fatal disease. And so uh, I discussed that it can take six to 12 months to get to a diagnosis. So slowly this de disease will progress uh, and then patients will develop large lymph nodes and in the absence of treatment, eventually pretty bad symptoms and weight loss. And eventually patients would, would pass away from this. And uh, it was a very unfortunate disease, especially one that primarily affected young adults and children. Uh, but in the early 1960s, some of the first patients were actually cured of Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, this was done uh, with radiation therapy. And um, in the 60s and 70s, we actually found that chemotherapy can cure many patients. Uh, so with the early stage patients, there's only a handful of lymph nodes involved, so the radiation can get all the lymph nodes in one part of the body. Uh, but if you have lymphoma that's involved all over, it can be hard to radiate the entire body, especially if there's lymphoma outside of the lymph nodes. Chemotherapy was able to cure many of these patients. Uh, but it became clear in the years and decades after this that these treatments were extremely toxic. So high-dose radiotherapy is very effective at uh, getting rid of Hodgkin lymphoma, but can lead to many long-term side effects, including lung disease, uh, heart disease, muscle wasting, second cancers. So these patients would be cured of their Hodgkin lymphoma and not die at a young age, but over the ensuing decades had many maladies uh, related to this. Uh, and often died of some complication of this, um, of their disease. And I've um, had the opportunity to take care of several of these patients over the years. Uh, uh, these types of broad radiation treatments were actually done up until the 1980s. So uh, having second lymphomas is not uncommon among these patients, and they'll sometimes come back to my clinic. And then this MOP chemotherapy, so the M in MOP is a chemo drug called meclorethamine, which is a derivation of nitrogen mustard, the same nitrogen mustard that was used uh, in the chemical warfare in, 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 uh, uh, in World War I. So they found uh, uh, in the soldiers who had received nitrogen mustard, there is a proximity effect. If you were too close, you died. If you were a little bit further away, your blood counts got low for a little bit and eventually recovered. And so it was very clear that if you got the dose right, you could kill a lot of these types of cancer cells uh, but it left some long changes in the body and actually led to second cancers and leukemias uh, at the higher doses. So there was a lot that was learned in these early decades. And so the modern era has learned from this. Uh, so radiation techniques uh, are improved. So having CT scans and now PET scans makes it much easier to deliver radiation only where there's cancer and not where there's not. In the 1960s, there were chest x-rays, and that was it. Otherwise, these people were pretty blind, so you just shot the radiation at all the lymph nodes because you couldn't tell which ones had it and which ones didn't. Uh, and then the PET scans also allow us to give the amount of treatment that's necessary for the stage. So uh, we know very precisely where the cancer is at the beginning, and we know that uh, certain stage one patients can do really well with less chemo, stage four patients will need more chemo. So it allows us to tailor the toxicity to the stage. And then more 
uh, uh, safer chemotherapy regimens were developed. So EBVD uh, is the backbone of Hodgkin lymphoma treatment in North America. It's much less toxic. Um, it has similar efficacy so to some of the more intensive regimens. Perhaps some of the more intensive regimens may be slightly more efficacious, but that gets all balanced out by a lot of the second cancers and complications from the more intensive chemo. So maybe you cure more people with intensive chemo at the beginning, but if 10% of the people get another cancer within 10 years, that balances it out dramatically. Uh, and then the other thing that's happened in the past decade is the development of antibody-based targeted therapy. And this has really revolutionized the treatment and management of Hodgkin lymphoma. And I think it has a lot of promise for the future uh, of how to optimize the use of these powerful uh, medications. So uh, to get into these targeted drugs, I think it's good to look at the three drugs that were approved in the last decade uh, and go into a little bit of how they work and why they work. So uh, the first one that was approved, uh, I believe in 2011, uh, was brentuximab the dotin. So uh, the type of drug that this is is something called an antibody drug conjugate. So um, what this means is, so our body has uh, countless different types of antibodies that uh, reflect a lifetime of exposure to different types of pathogens. So, for example, uh, let's say I get, um, let's say I get a measles vaccine when I'm younger, uh, my body develops antibodies to measles uh, that last for the rest of the life of my lifetime. Uh, what if one in a lab could design an antibody against a target on a cancer cell? And so that's essentially what this is. There's a protein called CD30 that's highly expressed on Hodgkin lymphoma cells, and an antibody might be able to target that. But even more than just having an antibody target it, imagine if uh, there's these uh, four red circles on the antibody. So those are toxins. So imagine if you could use this antibody to, like a Trojan horse, deliver the toxin to the cancer cells, uh, but only the cells that have the target will take in the toxin. And so uh, this allows one to concentrate uh, this type of chemo uh, that's connected to the uh, antibody, uh, concentrate it within the cell. Uh, and so that's what brentuximabidotin does. Um, there are, the side effects are related to how it works. So sometimes the toxin uh, can dislodge from the antibody, and so that can lead to side effects like neuropathy, so numbness, tingling, pain uh, in different nerves throughout the body. Uh, low blood counts can happen, less so by itself, more so in combination with other treatments. And then fatigue and infections are the most common things seen. Uh, so this has gotten many FDA approvals for Hodgkin lymphoma. So um, uh, the... Or, yeah, so the first one I have is actually the second on this list. I apologize. I think I put this out of order. So the first label it got was for, for patients who relapsed after an autologous transplant and had two prior chemotherapy regimens. The most uh, recent approval uh, was for untreated stage three or four patients in combination with chemotherapy. Uh, it also received a label for maintenance therapy in high-risk patients after autologous transplant. Um, it also doesn't have a technical FDA approval. Uh, but it, it is widely used uh, for second-line treatment by itself or in combination with chemo. Uh, it doesn't have an official label. It probably never will, and there's some quirks and nuance to how drugs are developed for why this doesn't happen, but there are official guidelines that experts uh, on the committee, and I'm on this committee um, uh, with many others from different institutions across the country. And so this is... Uh, used widely in this setting, and there's no problem to receive it in the setting. And there's a lot of trials to demonstrate its effectiveness uh, as a second line treatment as well. And so there's a term that's used a lot uh, for a variety of different types of cancers called immunotherapy. So the definition, unfortunately, varies depending on, on, the, um, on the type of treatment and the type of cancer. But in the context of Hodgkin lymphoma, Immunotherapy is a treatment that can help stimulate one's own immune system to fight cancer. And there are many different approaches that have been approved. There's actually two drugs that have been approved, and there's some others that are in development as well. So the way that the, the immunotherapy works is that uh, lymphomas should be perceived as 
foreign by our immune systems and destroyed. So we have immune cells that essentially perform surveillance across our body at all times. And there are probably tiny cancers that are on the verge of development all the time uh, in everybody, but the immune system very quickly recognizes these uh, as foreign and destroys them. And so there may be many patients where a precursor to Hodgkin lymphoma starts, but gets quickly destroyed before anybody even knows about it. And so the, the times where that doesn't work are probably the times where patients develop Hodgkin lymphoma that we know about. And so there's some abnormalities that cells can obtain that allows them to evade the immune system. Uh, so essentially hide in plain sight. And so there's a pathway called the PDL1, PD1, path, PD1 pathway um, uh, that helps disarm uh, immune cells. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But in essence, uh, what that means is if anybody's a Star Wars fan, essentially the cancer cell can tell the immune cell, this isn't what you're looking for, move along. Uh, and it's a pretty good analogy for how that works. The, the, the cells in the body know it's there, but they don't do anything about it. And so this is this this goes back to this rare Hodgkin malignant cell. So uh, incidentally, immunotherapy works the best in Hodgkin lymphoma compared to any other type of cancer, uh, meaning that it shrinks Hodgkin lymphoma more than it shrinks any other type of cancer. And this may have to do with the the, the key feature of Hodgkin lymphoma, which is that the immune the, the malignant cell or the cancer cell is rare, and there's already all these immune cells surrounding the cancer cell. Uh, but that's probably an ineffective immune response. So these immune cells know something's up, but they can't do anything about it or eliminate it completely. So there are two drugs that are FDA approved. One is called nivolumab, the other is called pembrolizumab. Uh, they can help overcome this evasion of the immune system. Uh, and so this is a, a little cartoon here. So the top cartoon uh, shows the mean looking cancer. Uh, putting this PDL1 protein on its surface. So this PDL1 protein, if the cancer cell puts it on its surface, it essentially disarms the immune cell. So um, you can see that immune cell getting disarmed, it's not able to do anything about it. Uh, but at the bottom, if one of these antibodies, so this is both nivolumab or pembrolizumab, it works the same. Um, if this antibody is present, uh, it prevents that interaction and allows the immune cell to do what it's designed to do, which is essentially eliminate foreign threats. Uh, and that's what the Hodgkin lymphoma cell normally should feel like. So these are the, uh, actually, side effects. So yeah, so sorry, I forgot to mention the side effects. I thought it was on the next slide. Um, so there are some side effects that can be associated with these. So there can be autoimmune side effects or where the immune system gets revved up too much. So this can lead both commonly to rash thyroid dysfunction, diarrhea, liver function test abnormalities. There are some very rare, serious, and fatal side effects that have been seen. Uh, so when we look into less than a one in a thousand patients, um, some very unusual things can be seen, but uh, thankfully they happen very rarely. Uh, and thousands of patients have received these drugs for a variety of different types of indications. Um, and Overall, if one of these immune reactions doesn't happen, and that's in the majority of patients, uh, patients tolerate this very, very well and don't get the same fatigue or risk of infection or low blood counts that you get with chemotherapy. Uh, so these are the two um, uh, drugs that are approved and their labels from the FDA. So nivolumab has a label for after three lines of therapy, and then there's some more specific labeling there. Um, I'll get into that in a second. And then pembrolizumab is a little more uh, general for patients who've relapsed or have a refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, in reality, if someone's received chemotherapy and brentuximab uh, with or without an autologous transplant and still has active lymphoma, that's generally when we use immunotherapy. Some of these very specific labels refer to how those initial trials were designed uh, and don't in many ways reflect uh, a common practice now. Uh, and so um, I, did, I put a little, uh, uh, I guess, a little advertisement in the middle and thank you for Lymphoma Research Foundation. I thought this was a good time to talk about it instead of just plopping at the end. Um, and, and the reason for that is 
uh, looking at immunotherapy combinations and Hodgkin lymphoma is actually the topic of a career development award that uh, I received from the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Uh, so I'm very honored and grateful to receive this. This uh, helps uh, me to be able to perform this kind of research. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is here in a second. Uh, and so I do want to thank for that. It's certainly an honor to get it. Um, and uh, also, I should mention, I was also, um, you look at the bottom of here, uh, there was a lymphoma clinical research mentoring program. It still exists today. Uh, and um, this is a fantastic program I was able to do a couple of years ago. Uh, essentially, it's essentially a lymphoma research retreat in many ways at the beginning, uh, where you spend several days at, um, uh, at a center with uh, multiple lymphoma experts, as well as other uh, junior faculty and trainees, all of whom have an interest in lymphoma. Uh, so it's a great way to network with many uh, uh, great individuals. Uh, and certainly some of the projects that I uh, wor uh, worked on there uh, form the basis of this Career Development Award. And so the topic of this Career Development Award was optimizing checkpoint inhibitor combinations in the treatment of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, and so the question that we asked uh, is part of this is, so how effective is immunotherapy with chemotherapy for untreated Hodgkin lymphoma? Uh, can we improve the effectiveness of the immunotherapy by actually combining newer agents with that? And then also to try to uh, address are PET scans the best way to assess for response in these uh, in patients on immunotherapy? Uh, and so there's a couple ways to think about that. So uh, are there novel non-PET-based tests that can be done? that will help us identify who's most likely to succeed. Uh, and then on the flip side, can we predict who is destined for treatment failure even before the treatment is over? Uh, and so this can have very broad implications for patients. Um, so moving on, uh, so beyond uh, uh, the Career Development Award topics, uh, just gonna ask what's next in Hodgkin lymphoma? So I think I've tried to do a broad overview of what is Hodgkin lymphoma? How does it present? What are the types of treatments that patients can receive? What are the new drugs? Uh, so what are the, the, the questions that have recently been answered? Which ones will be answered soon? And are there any drugs on the horizon? So this is something that's an active topic for us here at the University of Washington, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Uh, they're certainly a leader in Hodgkin lymphoma research. And so these are just some of the questions that we're asking at our center through a variety of clinical trials. Um, so one of them is, can novel therapies eliminate the need for radiation in early stage patients? And so there's a multi-institutional study from a, uh, from a research group called ACRU, uh, looking at combining brentuximab with chemotherapy and then giving patients nivolumab instead of radiation. Uh, the other question is, in, can we combine immunotherapy with chemo in untreated patients? So right now, immunotherapy is only approved in relapsed patients and generally multiply relapsed patients. Uh, but perhaps at the beginning is when immune therapy might work better, uh, when the immune system hasn't had all the chemotherapy or stem cell transplants. And so combining pembrolizumab plus AVD is, a, is a, an active clinical trial that we have open right now that should finish accrual early next year. And that's a single center study uh, written by us at our center and implemented at our center. There's also, we just completed a clinical trial looking at can brentuximab uh, vedotin pre-transplant improve outcomes in first relapse. So this is a single center investigator initiated study. Uh, I've had the opportunity the last couple of months to go through some of the data for this. Um, we'll be presenting it uh, at meetings later this fall. Uh, we do feel that this is an effective regimen. We've, put, we've uh, already done um, uh, presented some of this uh, before, uh, but this will become public knowledge later this year, uh, and we're very excited to present it. Uh, and then can we improve the efficacy of immunotherapy? Um, and so um, there, we know that immunotherapy is uh, very effective, uh, and I'll show you some of the slides later about how effective it is, but most patients aren't cured with it. So can we improve the ability to uh, get into remission with these agents by combining it with something else. And so we have two single center investigator initiated studies that were written and uh, performed just at our center. Um, so one uses a drug called Embralisip and the other uses a drug called Brentuximab. So other new data um, in terms of what's new for Hodgkin lymphoma. 
Uh, so an untreated Hodgkin lymphoma, brentuximab plus AVD, did show improved progression-free survival. Uh, so that means that uh, about a 6% benefit. So if we treated 17 patients with that new combination, we prevent one relapse. Um, there are some uh, pluses and minuses with this. So it's a more intensive regimen, requires growth factors to combat the increased risk of infection. We know neuropathy is common uh, with this. Even though it resolves, it can, uh, in most patients, it can be very bothersome. Um, and so it's more controversial to use that more intensive regimen in all advanced stage patients. Uh, so it certainly requires a personalized conversation. There is an ongoing randomized study uh, comparing the brentuximab combination and then an immunotherapy combination in advanced stage patients. And at the end is, can novel agents eliminate the need for radiation in early stage Hodgkin lymphoma? So there have been multiple chemotherapy-only trials uh, that have shown that radiation does have some benefit for early stage patients. Uh, most patients are cured without radiation, but many relapses can be prevented with it. Uh, but we don't know what that means in the era of some of these novel agents. If we give these novel agents at the beginning, can we eliminate the need for radiation? So there's ongoing studies that try to answer that question as well. And then in relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, um, What's probably clear is that receiving brentuximab-based therapy before a transplant probably improves outcomes. Uh, so there are multiple studies of brentuximab with or without chemotherapy. Um, one advantage of brentuximab is a pretty potent drug. Uh, it can put patients into remission quite quickly. Uh, and so some of the problems that we see in untreated patients where you're giving it for six total months are less of an issue in the relapse setting because these regimens are given for much shorter periods of time. So a very quick, potent remission can help improve long-term outcomes before an autologous transplant. Um, there's also some more data to be presented soon. I haven't seen any of this uh, other than a press release. Uh, so is immunotherapy alone better than brentuximab in relapse patients? And so there is a study that suggests that pembrolizumab will work longer than brentuximab. Uh, and so each drug has its own strengths. Brentuximab is very potent and can get very quick remissions. Um, immunotherapy takes longer to work, but can work a lot longer and have fewer long-term side effects. So they each have their own strengths in different settings. So we'll learn a little bit more about that later this year. Uh, in terms of two drugs that are in development the closest, um, there's a drug called CAMET. It's a long uh, word, and I just I thought I'd spare you. If you Google CAN-ET, you'll find it. Uh, so it's another antibody drug um, conjugate. Uh, it's very potent in Hodgkin lymphoma, so it has a similar design to brentuximab, but just a different target. Uh, but the development got delayed due to a rare neurological side effect called Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, that some of the patients had on the early stage study. And so it's a study back open, uh, but certainly has given some pause, and hopefully with more patients on the study, uh, we'll have a better sense of how often this happens, and that can help determine what the place of this drug is if it does get approved. And then CAR T cells are, of course, all the rage for most types of lymphomas, um, but the CAR T cells that are currently FDA approved for non-Hodgkin lymphoma don't work on Hodgkin lymphoma because the target isn't there. So the target CD19 for the approved CAR T cells isn't present on the Hodgkin lymphoma cell, so you have to create a CAR with that target. So this is in early stages of development. I don't think this is close to an approval. Um, I think this could be the topic of an entire lecture about what is the setting of CAR T cells, even if these work. Um, I, I think in Hodgkin lymphoma, I'm gonna show you some slides after this. Um, the need is a little bit less for CAR T cells in Hodgkin than in non-Hodgkin lymphoma in terms of the number of people, uh, as well as the potential benefits uh, of these. So I'll go into that in a second here. Uh, and then in terms of relapse Hodgkin lymphoma, so we know um, that PD-1 inhibitors uh, or immunotherapy really transform life for chemo uh, refractory patients. So uh, before, most patients would succumb to their disease. So if the chemo stopped working, most would succumb to their disease within the year uh, or require a transplant from another donor, which has its own risks. Uh, uh, potentially fatal risks. And so one thing, we, we don't know if immunotherapy can cure Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, but we, I do know that in my practice, immunotherapy can turn Hodgkin lymphoma into a chronic disease. So this is something, when I say chronic disease, it's something where someone can be on this treatment, maintain a good quality of life, 
um, similar to somebody who's on high blood pressure pills or somebody with diabetes. So uh, you don't cure high blood pressure with the pills. You don't cure diabetes with insulin. You help manage it. And so that's one way to think of immunotherapy in the setting is that it's a way to manage the Hodgkin lymphoma in a way that you can't really do it with chemotherapy. And so um, this is the slide that I use to kind of, I think, end the talk. And uh, there's a lot of things that we can get from this slide. So we know this is a long-term follow-up of pembrolizumab and relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. So this is a curve called a Kaplan-Meier curve. And so what this means is uh, the lines on here represent patients who've been treated over time. And each time the step goes down, that's a patient who's unfortunately passed from their a Hodgkin lymphoma. And at a certain time point, you can see how many people are still alive. And so when you look three years after starting treatment, over 85% of people are alive. And so when I told you virtually everybody had passed within a year before this, this really is a game-changing drug. So even if immunotherapy can't cure many of these patients, it essentially puts the lymphoma into hibernation and allows people to live a very, very, very long time. And so this has many, many implications. So one, can we use immunotherapy at the beginning? So untreated patients. Um, the hard part is we cure so many with chemotherapy, uh, it's hard to try something else. The bar is so high. Uh, and so right now that the trials for using immunotherapy or chemo-free approaches are primarily focused on older patients where it's harder to tolerate chemotherapy. And then when you look at this bar here in terms of, you know, how many people are alive two or three years later, CAR T cells are a lot harder because there are a lot of side effects associated with CAR T cells uh, in the treatments. And then long-term, we don't know what long-term side effects you can get from CAR T cells. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's much clearer in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So in the CAR T cells that are approved, uh, before CAR T cells were around, uh, the types of patients who receive CAR, 90% would have passed of their lymphoma at a year. And so when you look at a situation of a Hodgkin lymphoma, where over 90% of patients are alive a year later, um, it makes it much more sensitive to long-term side effects of CAR T-cells. So to, to me, it's, it'll be interesting to see these studies develop uh, and try to figure out what's the best place for them. And so uh, that's my last slide. So of course, I want... I, Want to thank, uh, I always want to thank my clinical team, research staff, mentors, colleagues. Uh, so without them, I wouldn't be in the position to talk to you today. Uh, certainly patients like you, I'm of course making an assumption everybody listening is patients, but uh, I do want to thank uh, patients out there, patients who've enrolled on studies. This is how we learn about the disease. This is how we determine what are the best treatments for the future. This is how we determine what doesn't work. Um, and so we really can't make things better without clinical trial participation. So I always encourage patients who are eligible for clinical trials to strongly consider them, not just to get uh, access to new drugs before anybody else, but also for the altruistic reason of participating in research. Um, and so there's a variety of different resources that are available. Um, I'm sure you've gotten more information in your email about this when you've registered, um, and then I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. And I think we're getting the, the moderators are getting the questions together. Yeah. And just while we're waiting for that, actually, I'll go back to our slide and just talk a little bit more um, about some of our resources that the Lymphoma Research Foundation has. Um, just once again, if you have a question, feel free to type it in the Q&A box um, while I'm discussing this. But just to give you a little bit of an overview, the Lymphoma Research Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As you continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment specific resources, programs, and services, all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma-specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link 
or via our LRS website at lymphoma.org if you're on the phone. The LRS helpline can answer your specific questions about lymphoma, as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. The Lymphoma Support Network connects patients and caregivers with volunteers who have similar experiences to help give others strength to meet the challenges they may have to face. We also offer a variety of publications, like Dr. Lynch mentioned, that may have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure you have access to the latest lymphoma information. We have comprehensive books on understanding non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and the transplantation process. We offer a variety of easy to understand fact sheets on each of the subtypes of lymphoma, as well as supportive care topics that may be relevant to your lymphoma experience. Finally, we've launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through this challenging time. Please visit our Learning Center for access to webinars, articles, and other resources specific to COVID-19. I really hope you'll take advantage of some of the great resources and services that LRS provides. If you have questions regarding what you learned today, or if you need information about relevant treatment op options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to LRS through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. Thank you all again for your time today. We'll now begin our Q&A portion of the program. Just as a reminder, please keep your questions as general as possible so that the entire audience can benefit from their answers. In addition, next week on May 11th, we'll be hosting our second webinar on COVID-19, Managing Concerns for Lymphoma Patients. We'll discuss updates, clinical trial information, as well as managing stress. If you have any questions related to COVID-19, please tune into our webinar next Monday. You can sign up at lymphoma.org slash webinars. And with that, I will turn the call over to our moderator. Thank you, Jesse. Ladies and gentlemen, as you've been doing, please submit your questions through the Q&A box located to the right of your screens. We'll take as many questions as possible. But if you have a question that does not get answered today, you can always reach out to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's helpline at 800 500-9976. Uh, Dr. Lynch, our first question asks, if one is responding positively to initial treatment, do the complete treatment cycles have to be given? Yeah, that's a great question. I get this all the time. So um, I think this is referring to, the, so it's very standard for patients receiving ABVD or ABVD like chemotherapy uh, after two months of two, uh, two months or two cycles of treatment to have a PET scan. And um, that's done for a variety of reasons. Most studies have looked at that as a prognostic marker, meaning patients who do well at that point uh, will likely continue to do well, or patients who haven't done well by that point might benefit from a, a change of therapy. Uh, about 85% of patients after two months uh, well, depending on stage, 85 to 90 percent of patients will be in a complete remission after those first two uh, months of treatment. And so uh, what I tell patients is the first two months are to get the lymphoma that you can see, and then the rest of the treatment is to get what you can't see. Uh, and there's a variety of clinical trials, uh, particularly in patients who do not receive radiotherapy, so patients who don't get radiation, uh, there does appear to be a benefit to getting them more cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, and in advanced stage patients, it's definitely mandatory. So in short, uh, it helps inform us to make sure that the treatment's working and we don't need to change it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that patients can get fewer cycles with few exceptions. Um, there has been in, uh, there was a study out of the UK that looked at radiation-free approaches in early stage patients. That's one rare exception, uh, but even then, um, it's not used as widely. There's a lot of worry about cutting the chemotherapy short without radiation and uh, affecting the outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Our next question asks, is the current guidance for HL survivors to wait on visiting the doctor for their yearly HL checkup due to COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a variety of factors that would go into that. So somebody who maybe had high risk lymphoma, or there was a concern about whether or not they're in remission, I would consider that to be completely different. But certainly, in someone who is in a complete remission and is in long term follow up, uh, absolutely, those could be switched to telemedicine just for check ins to make sure that everybody's doing okay symptom wise. I've I've been doing these check ins mostly just to give additional counseling to patients as well about 
how to handle this and what this means. Uh, but I think that unless there's a new symptom or complaint, it's reasonable to defer the visit or transition it to a telehealth visit. I think most practices, uh, including us, have, have done telehealth. And I've done many uh, Hodgkin telehealth follow-up visits. Thank you. Our next question asks, for which patients would you recommend brintuximab, vedotin? Yeah, that's a loaded question, uh, mostly because, um, so I can go back to the slide for where the FDA approved it. Um, yeah, so these are the approvals for it. Um, I would say that the, the time where it would make the most sense right now. So second line therapy, if there hasn't been brentuximab before, I would say absolutely. It seems that brentuximab uh, really can help get very uh, deep remissions in patients prior to auto transplant. Um, select untreated patients uh, who are stage three and stage four. Uh, I don't typically treat everybody with brentuximab who's as advanced stage disease. Uh, I tend to reserve it for the higher risk patients. Um, uh, because some of the side effects can be quite bothersome when you give it to everybody. So those are the main settings. Um, in terms of if someone happened to relapse late and has never had brentuximab, it's reasonable to give. Um, maintenance therapy is also more controversial now. The maintenance therapy study uh, was done before patients could get brentuximab prior to the transplant. So we don't really know what that means at this time, but same thing, select high-risk patients, I might consider that as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question asks, if a patient has had and recovered from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, what is the likelihood you could get Hodgkin's lymphoma later in life? How related are the two diseases, and does having one increase the chance of getting the other? I mean, maybe it does. I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I mean, I, I can say that um, there's a slight risk of cancer is just related to the chemotherapy. So um, for ABVD, it's approximately 1% of patients may have a second cancer later in life of any type. Uh, and for non-Hodgkin lymphoma treatments, depending on the type of cancer, that's probably also in the low single digits. And so some of those might include Hodgkin lymphoma. So if you're diagnosed with one lymphoid cancer, your chance of getting another is higher but it's not universal. It just means that your risk is higher compared to the rest of the population. So I, that's probably the best way to answer that question. Thank you. And another question. How do you convey to young adult patients the importance of active surveillance for late or long-term effects? It varies based on the type of treatment that they've received. Um, I think as time goes on, uh, we're going to start realizing that with some of the more modern therapies that some of these rates may start going down. So much of the guidance is based on some of these large radiation fields and much more intensive chemotherapy regimens. And these active surveillance, it takes 20 or 30 years to know what the late effects are. Um, for sure, I think uh, for breast cancer, it, uh, we do for patients who've had radiation, we recommend earlier uh, mammograms. Um, and then uh, we've also starting to realize that the, the risk of long-term heart issues, it, it's just, it's a lot less than I think we had seen with some of these earlier regimens. So for now, I do think it's very important to make sure that if somebody does graduate from an oncology office, that they're well-established as a primary care physician, maintaining good health otherwise, and getting age-appropriate cancer screening. And the exception is for young women who have had prior radiation that involves around the breast. They need to have um, uh, mammograms starting a lot earlier or breast MRIs. Thank you. And our next question, why is NLPHL called Hodgkin's but treated differently? Uh, this has to go back to that, you know, the fact that Hodgkin was first coined in the 1820s. So all they had back in the 1820s with a microscope with some light, and sometimes they could add some different inks and stains to it. Uh, so when you don't have modern diagnostic technology, they look the same. Uh, so both of these are characterized by a very large cancer cell surrounded by many small non-cancer cells. 
But when with modern technology, the, the cells are very different and they respond very differently to treatment. And once the ability to distinguish the two uh, was better, uh, uh, was better able to be done, we realized that the natural history is different as well. They behave extremely differently. Uh, so that's the main reason for it. They're, they're two very distinct diseases, but if you only had one microscope and nothing else, you might think they look the same. Thank you. Uh, next question. How can I find clinical trials that are recruiting for HL in my area? Yeah, so clinicaltrials.gov um, is, a, is a national website. And in fact, even international sites uh, will register clinical trials there. And so there's a way to search by disease. So you can type Hodgkin lymphoma. And then there's a search bar for location, so geographic location. So you can do it by country and even within state. I don't think you can get much past state. You might be able to put in like a search term. So I'm in Seattle, a search term for Seattle, but you're probably better off at least just doing the state. That probably is only harmful in California where the state's so big. In most states, that's probably going to be enough. And so that'll list the, the trials that are there. And then if you click on the top left, it'll you can say which trials are recruiting uh, or sort it by which ones are active. Some of the old trials will be on there as well. So that's something to be cautious for. And then at the bottom of those pages, when a clinical initial study is there, there'll be contact information there. Uh, and so it'll usually be somebody who's loosely affiliated with it. It may not be the right, right person, but usually that person will be able to get you to where you need to go or very quickly determine if this is the right trial or not. And if it's potentially the right trial, perhaps set up a consultation. Thank you. Uh, our next question, what exactly needs to be done for CART cell to be more effective for Hodgkin's lymphoma to be readily available, similar to auto transplant for reoccurrence a second time? No, but did you say CAR, C-A-R-T, CAR-T? Yes. Is that it? Yeah, I, well, we don't know if it works yet. It's very, very early. So the, the studies for uh, auto transplants for Hodgkin lymphoma, hundreds of patients have participated in those studies, and over the years, thousands of patients have received it. So it's a very long track record versus only a dozen or more people have received these kind of CAR T cells. We don't know if they work. We don't know how long they work. We don't have a sense of any sort of short or long-term side effects related to these. So one is a known entity with a known uh, cure rate, and the other is a complete unknown and probably should at least in the short term be reserved for patients who don't have any other options, at least until we know how well it works. Uh, and even in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma is maybe 35, 40% of people are cured with CAR T cells in the relapse setting. And we can cure far more with chemotherapy and autotransplant. So uh, just keeping that in mind. Thank you. And our last question asks, are there lifestyle recommendations for intense radiation or chemotherapy regimens to help combat neuropathy, neuropathy or other side effects? Yeah, I wish there was a great way to prevent the neuropathy. And really the only way to prevent it is to not to give the drugs that cause it in the first place, um, or if it starts getting bad, to, to stop those drugs. Uh, it's actually the primary reason I'm more reluctant to give brentuximab vidotin in the, in the frontline setting. Um, the, it, it's, it really can affect quality of life uh, uh, to give those agents. And so I try to reserve them for the people who really, really need it. So high risk patients, maybe stage four patients, um, as well as in relapse patients, where you can accept the risks uh, of neuropathy and um, versus the alternative. Um, so there's not a great way to prevent it, unfortunately. And there's also not great treatments for it either, other than time. And that's one thing that's incredibly frustrating about the neuropathy associated with some of these treatments. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the conclusion of our program. We thank each of you for joining us on today's call and hope you found the information both informative and also hopeful. We'd also like to thank our sponsor once again for making this program possible, Bristol Myers Squibb. Please remember if you have any additional questions or would like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma, you can reach out to our LRF helpline at 800 500 9976. 
Also, at the conclusion of this program, you will receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. I would ask that you please take a few minutes to complete this brief evaluation as these are important for helping LRF to ensure they deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. And with that, I'd like to thank you once again for joining us. Have a great day.